Good morning. I'm Admiral Bob Papp, and I'm delighted to be here today. President Grimson, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a pleasure to return here to the Arctic Circle Assembly on behalf of Secretary John Kerry and my role as the Special Representative of the Arctic for the United States. I actually began my assignment uh, almost two years ago here at uh, Arctic Circle, and I'll always be indebted to President Grimson and Alice Rogoff for giving me the opportunity to come here for the first time internationally to present uh, what we were beginning to develop as the United States Chairmanship uh, for the Arctic Council and on our program. Uh, one of the things that I was left with uh, during my time here at Arctic Circle last time was the large numbers of young people who were in the audience. And in fact, my favorite session that I did during my time here was to uh, get in with young leaders and talk to them. So I thought uh, that I would structure my comments this morning focused towards young leaders, and uh, there will be a couple of uh, perhaps uh, popular icons that I'll talk about, and uh, for those of you more mature leaders in the audience who don't uh, perhaps recognize them, turn to a young person and ask them. They'll explain it to you. Now, I enjoyed my visit so much last time that I brought my wife Linda back with me. Uh, we're going to enjoy uh, some of the cultural activities. And I also am uh, particularly honored that uh, Minister Soini will uh, follow me a, a little bit later. I had the uh, great privilege of meeting him in Helsinki last January as we went there to begin the process of transferring the chairmanship of the Arctic Council from the United States to Finland's leadership. And then we met again briefly a few months ago when President Obama hosted the Nordic leaders at the White House. Sir, it's good to see you again. Now, one of the goals of our United States chairmanship has been to further strengthen the Arctic Council as the preeminent international forum for the Arctic. And when I was here last time, as I said, we were making preparations to assume the chairmanship. And I'm incredibly proud of the efforts that the United States chairmanship team has done and their ongoing commitment of all the member states, the permanent participants, and the observers. Tremendous work is getting done. But while most of you here are probably expecting a status report on the chairmanship, Quite frankly, there are still several months of hard work in front of us. So instead, what I'd like to do this morning is offer you some of my observations as I look back on my voyage over the last couple of years and give you some thoughts on what we need to consider as we look to the future and to the Arctic that future generations will inherit. Now, for some of you who've heard me speak before, you know that I enjoy studying history, particularly maritime history. So I wanted to show you a picture of a historical painting that's in my office. Uh, this is the United States schooner Effie M. Morrissey, and it's a sailing vessel that is of some importance to this group. She spent over 25 years, between 1920 and 1945, exploring and charting the Arctic with her captain, a man named Robert Bartlett. Interestingly, Bartlett was also the captain of the SS Roosevelt, the famous ship that enabled Robert Perry in his quest to reach the North Pole. Now, hopefully, if some of you study the Arctic, and I know many of you do, you're aware of Admiral Perry and his name, and he needs little introduction. But further research into Perry taught me that despite all we know about him and his great accomplishments, he might not have achieved his goal if it was not for a man that many of you probably don't know. Now, his name is Matthew Henson. He was an African-American, a sailor, an explorer, and he accompanied Perry as they made the trek to the North Pole. But further study reveals it wasn't just Perry and Henson. It was a diverse team, including Inuits from Greenland, that used their unique skills and abilities to accomplish what many thought was a nearly insurmountable task. Now, Matthew Henson and his accomplishments have often been forgotten. But it just so happens that this past August was the anniversary of Matthew Henson's 150th birthday. We chose to honor him with a celebration in Washington, D.C., and we even flew in his great-grandson from Greenland. Now, you might not realize it, but 2016 happens to be a year of anniversaries. It isn't just the 150th birthday of a great Arctic explorer. We're also celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Arctic Council, the preeminent forum where governments meet to discuss Arctic issues. And it's the 50th anniversary of a pop culture icon, Star Trek. Now, I know a lot of you out there are probably wondering right now, where's he going with this? And frankly, I don't blame you. 
Uh, one of the things that's amused me over the last couple of years it, and sometimes frustrated me but always entertained me is the way the media, in spite of the way I craft my speeches to talk about the chairmanship program, they always seem to pick up on my anecdotes or sea stories that I tell and then they write stories about that. So I'm not going to go into those anecdotes and sea stories, but what I will tell you is that last year in Montreal, I was giving a lecture about the United States Chairmanship Program of the, and, uh, and the Arctic Council. When we got to the question and answer period, I was asked if there are enough icebreakers for the United States and enough icebreakers in the world. Now, I know my Finnish friends are going to tell you that there's never enough icebreakers. But in my answer, I suggested that we probably have enough icebreakers and that maybe in the future, I speculated, there might be an opportunity where instead of countries trying to outbuild each other in terms of numbers of icebreakers, they might share their icebreaker fleets and we might have international crews. And I suggested that we might look to fiction. In fact, I suggested that Gene Roddenberry's fictional concept of a fleet of spaceships in Star Trek and the concept of Starfleet. Why can't we have shared icebreakers with international crews? Well, this is not the first time Star Trek has come up in my office. A member of my team, uh, Hillary, who always accompanies me, is a huge Star Trek fan. And her constant references to the TV series and movies reminds me why Star Trek is so similar to our work in the Arctic. It's the concept of diversity, inclusiveness, and cooperation and the desire to seek out a better future for us all. Well, this is our diverse multinational crew in the Arctic Council. I also spoke about the diverse crew that made it possible for Robert Perry to reach the North Pole. So what we have is a team in history, a team for today, and a fictional team in the future, all possible because of their foundations built upon diversity, inclusiveness, and cooperation. So the characters of Star Trek were always looking forward, thinking of new possibilities. And I believe this is the mentality that we need as we think about the Arctic. While it's fair to celebrate the past 20 years of the Arctic Council, we should rather be focused on where we want to be in the next 20 years. Now, when I first started traveling around the world talking about the US chairmanship program, beginning here in Iceland, one of the, uh, I heard a number of comments that were repeated often, and one of the ones that was most gratifying uh, was that when I spoke to people, they were very excited about United States leadership. However, that comment was always followed with a qualifying comment saying that they were skeptical about the United States' long-term commitment to the Arctic. Now, these are comments that I took to heart as we prepared the program, and I'm proud of the actions that the United States has taken to demonstrate its commitment to the region. It was demonstrated just over a year ago in Anchorage, Alaska with our Glacier Conference. Glacier was attended by secretaries uh, or by foreign ministers of many of our countries, uh, Secretary Kerry, and most importantly, President Obama, and they all gathered there to discuss the importance of the Arctic. And most importantly, following Glacier, President Obama spent three days visiting Alaska, becoming the first sitting president in history to set foot in the, in the American Arctic. And I can tell you that the president personally touched the lives of, the, of people in Alaska and in the communities that he visited. But more importantly, the people of Alaska touched President Obama personally. Glacier inspired the international, uh, the interagency back in Washington, D.C. to look at the Arctic in a new light. Investments in clean energy solutions, improved navigational charting, new icebreakers and other initiatives were announced as a result of the president's historic visit. The president followed up with a summit meeting with Prime Minister, uh, Canadian Prime Minister Trudeau, followed by a summit meeting with all the Nordic leaders, both of which included substantial discussions on the Arctic. Then there's the Arctic Council, the cornerstone of our international Arctic policy, and as I said, the highest level forum where governments and representatives of the Arctic's indigenous peoples gather to discuss the region, its future, and how to balance the environmental protection with sustainable development. Just yesterday, in Portland, Maine, the Arctic Council's senior Arctic officials concluded a critical meeting 
and it was our first meeting outside of Alaska, and now we have literally spanned the United States from coast to coast with meetings for the Arctic Council. And as we continue to tell our story and illustrate the United States' commitment to the Arctic, I hope we've dispelled that comment that I heard that questioned our level of long-term commitment. Based on Glacier, the leadership summits, the Arctic Science Ministerial, and the United States uh, Arctic Council chairmanship, all of which in some way have been followed up by concrete domestic actions by our president, I think I can state with confidence that the United States will continue to be an enthusiastic partner as I project to the future. But just as we look to the future, what is that future and how do we get there? What will be the state of the Arctic 20, 50, or 100 years from now? I strongly believe that any Arctic initiative can't function unless it recognizes the importance of good science and the benefits from its active use. That's why if all goes well, the Arctic Council Ministerial in Fairbanks, Alaska next May will feature the signing of an Arctic Science Cooperation Agreement to further facilitate the needs of scientists in the Arctic, and it will become the third binding agreement of the Council's 20-year history. Other significant deliverables to be highlighted at the five Fairbanks Ministerial are all supported at their foundation by good science. And I've learned a lot since becoming the special representative, but perhaps the most important lesson that I've taken away from the last two years is how vital science is to everything that we do. Good science makes good policy. Now, even the Starship Enterprise on Star Trek had an overarching mission of peace and exploration with a crew made up primarily of scientists and researchers. In this fictional world of the future, they recognized the importance of science, which led to advancement, the preservation of resources, and literal worlds of new possibilities. So I've given you my anecdote for the day, uh, but I don't want to get away without telling a sea story as well. And the sea story that I'll simply tell you is that one of the most important things to me in my career as a sailor was having a good captain on my first assignment. Now, I thought he gave me an awful lot of work to do, reading about uh, the history of Alaska, the history of the Bering Sea, and I thought all he wanted to do was get me to work so he'd have another deck watch officer. So from my young and immature point of view, I thought he just wanted to, to get me up there on deck so that we'd have another fresh uh, officer to, uh, to take some of the workload. But it was later, as I matured, that I realized the real reason. My captain knew it was his responsibility, which became my responsibility later in my career, to train the next watch, those people who will replace us in the future. Now, it worked for me, and I had a, a relatively successful career, uh, but I still recall the lessons that that first captain taught me, and I've passed those things on to young officers that I've worked with in the Coast Guard. So it carried over into what we're doing in our chairmanship program as well. And I believe two of the most important projects the United States has initiated are focused on this very important issue. The Fulbright Arctic Initiative is comprised of 17 scholars among all eight Arctic nations. We're training them and they in turn are helping us as they perform research, educate policymakers on what they've discovered and what they project is the future of the Arctic. And the United States Arctic Youth Ambassadors are 22 young people from Alaska between the ages of 17 and 23. They're taking the world by storm as they travel around the world and they share their customs, their stories with world leaders, including how climate change is impacting their homes and their way of life. These amazing and inspirational young people see that their future does not look like it's going to be the same as the world that their grandparents and parents all called home, and they want to do something about it. They want to make certain that the Arctic remains viable for their generation and generations to come. The Arctic Youth Ambassadors and the Fulbright Arctic Scholars represent the next watch. And just like my former captain, it's up to us to provide the necessary guidance and ensure these future leaders are poised and motivated to take on the ambitious challenges and opportunities of a changing Arctic. And it isn't just important to train the next watch. You have to listen and take into account diverse points of view and there are many in the Arctic region. I hinted earlier that one of the great things about Star Trek wasn't necessarily that it was a fun, future-oriented science fiction television show when it first aired in 1966. At that time, it represented diversity, 
and inclusiveness and highlighted a multinational crew made possible by the belief of acceptance as they sought to promote peace throughout the galaxy. It wasn't perfect, and there were bumps along the way, but the foundation of their mission never wavered. We aim to be inclusive in our efforts in the Arctic as well. For example, we conducted a search and rescue exercise during August in Alaska to operationalize the Arctic Council's search and rescue agreement. The exercise featured multinational cooperation and participation among a variety of Arctic states and local communities. In the Arctic Council itself, eight member states only advance decisions if there's a consensus among the countries. A variety of options have to be taken into consideration, especially those representing the indigenous peoples of the Arctic. And as we look to the future and, and about the Arctic we want, the importance of forward thinking, diversity, inclusiveness, and cooperation, and training and empowering future generations are critical to the success of our actions. We have to take steps now to protect the Arctic marine environment from the impacts stemming from increased activity, both inside and outside the Arctic region. We must ensure human activity in the Arctic is safe and sustainable. We need to increase our scientific knowledge and we have to make decisions based upon science and take into account the generations of knowledge found in our indigenous communities. And we must join together in the international community to implement the COP21 Paris Agreement and reduce carbon and methane emissions. So we'll take a team of diversity and inclusiveness like the audience in this room to go boldly where very few have gone before to ask and to find the answers to what may seem daunting and impossible questions and ensure that the Arctic is able to live long and prosper for generations to come. Thank you very much for having me back today and uh, good luck with the remainder of the assembly. Thank you.